I also feel great. I feel full of positive energy from this conference and meeting so many people. But also I feel a bit sad because our conference is coming to the end. However, we still have a lot of things to do. Lightning talks. First lightning talk is from Dima and the topic is game engine in Python. Dima, could you please come here? Yes, hello, I'm Dima. I'm going to talk about my custom game engines that I made in Python. So I'm 13 years old. I'm currently a game developer. Yeah, interested in game development and have experience with uh, some game engines like Godot Engine. So yes, this is my first year of Python also. So what is a game engine? A game engine is basically a tool for game creation. Yeah, why create an own game engine? Yeah, for the most part it's for fun or for learning experience. Sometimes it's for speed or a specific use case. So I made my own one called Fusion Engine. It's based on PySDL2 and graphics library. Yes, you see here a repo, QR code will be on the, on the end for presentation. So here's the basic example. On the left, you see a, a popular game engine called Pygame, and on the right, you see mine. So both do the same thing, and uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I tried to make a speed comparison, and as you see, uh, a popular one like Pygame takes like three seconds uh, to load a window, and mine one takes one second. Yeah, a small checklist what our plans are to like make the game engine. Our plan was also to implement some Rust at the slow parts. Yeah, it's a little bit inspired from this Euro Python. Yes, this is this is it. Thanks to our computer contributors. Yeah, we are welcome to new contributors. So if you want to contribute, yeah, just go with this QR code and. Uh, no, I'm not. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please welcome Deb, that will tell us something about the Python Software Foundation. Mm. Oh, there we are. All right. Uh, sometimes I tell people I am at the PSF, and then they say something to me that leads me to believe that they don't really understand what we are or what we do. So I'm going to answer that first. Uh, and then I want us to be friends. So, um, so first of all, we're the vendor-neutral, community-driven home of Python. And everyone likes Python, right? Yay! <laughs> that sounds like kind of a, like a nice thing. Like, I've worked at other nonprofits, and like, hosting means like, oh, those two boxes that I move around in my basement. Uh, not so much for Python. It's a really big kind of overwhelming infrastructure, like kind of hurtling into the future. On average, a version of Python is downloaded over 300 million times per day, which is a lot. Uh, and then uh, in last year, the PyPI uh, saw a 57% growth in both download and bandwidth. So when I say massive infrastructure, I mean pretty massive. So that's the first thing we do. Uh, we also have this grants program. This is our lovely accounting team. They let me post this picture of them looking really tired at the PyLadies auction at PyCon this year. Um, but they are lovely. Uh, so in 2022, we gave out 152 grants, totaling over $200,000 to a bunch of different countries. Uh, why am I telling you this? I mean, it's nice. I do like to brag. That's part of being a person working at a nonprofit. But I want you all to apply for grants. 
So this is the URL. I'm gonna leave it up there for a second. Like, please take our money. We wanna help you build the Python community. We wanna buy lunch at your thing. We want you to get more people. We want you to give out travel grants, whatever it is that's gonna make your event extra awesome. Uh, we're also the back office for about 15 other initiatives, a mix of like meetup groups, other PyCons that happen in other places, and some technical projects, uh, including the Global Network of Pi Ladies chapters. Yay, Pi Ladies, right? <laughs> and then, of course, we've also been putting on PyCon US for about 20 years. So here are some folks. Maybe you recognize some of them, maybe not. Uh, that uh, that's like kind of the, the big PyCon, I guess, but it is not the only one. Uh, we do also offer travel grants because uh, having come here from the US to Prague, I'm aware that it's far and uh, costs some money. So uh, if you want to come join us at PyCon US next year in Pittsburgh, uh, which is not very dry and not very weird about being GL LGBTQ, which is also important to us. So yay, Pittsburgh. Um, they have pierogies. I hear you also like those. So you'll feel right at home, I promise. And then finally, uh, the last thing I would love it is if you all became either supporting members of the PSF or certified yourself as a contributing or managing member. So the supporting one is kind of the more traditional, like where you give us money and then we count you as a member. The one that I think is extra cool is the contributing or managing member, which is if you work on Python or the Python community. It doesn't have to be code. It can be setting up meetings. It can be going and driving to pick up the pizzas. It can be hanging out at the uh, registration booth here. Five hours a month, on average, you can certify yourself as a contributing or managing member of the PSF. And that means you get to vote on the PSF's board of directors, which we just did a director uh, election. We, we elected Chuck as a brand new board of uh, director. Yay! So you can start telling her, no. Uh, you should bring the complaints to me and the sparkly inspirational ideas to Chuck um, because I, I'm getting paid, so I'll take the complaints. Um, so uh, that's the URL for that. I'm keeping it short and sweet. I'm here like after Lightning Talks if you want to ask me questions. Find me on Twitter, find me on Mastodon. Really find me on Mastodon. I don't want to be on Twitter anymore. Um, thank you so much for your time, and uh, thanks for having me. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Arthur. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Turn this one. I think it is. Let's see. Bigger, bigger. Hello. Bigger, bigger? Okay. Um, what can I? Can I try to do control plus? Control plus. Okay. Sorry. Um, so testing files. So, testing files in Python. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to do this mirror mode. Damn. Mirror, apply. I need to have it in mirror mode. Yes, like this. Sorry. Uh, so, testing files. Um, if you testing files in Python, you don't know really where to start because you either don't have the files or you, you want to do automated testing, so you put them in the repository, but then you can't because you need to first obfuscate the data or you don't have the files for all specific things. So I'll show you how to create files in many formats with no effort using these two libraries, a faker and a faker file. And it starts just like that. You just um, import uh, the faker class, uh, then you import the provider, the file provider, that you want to use, you initialize the faker, you register the file provider that you want to use, and then you just do it like this, like, uh, 
docx file, in this case, this is a docx file, and then is generated for you. As you can see, so um, the first print that you see is just uh, um, the, this file, the file object. And it looks like a string, but it's not a string. It's, uh, it's like a string-like object, which has some additional metadata it contains. Um, one of them is the full path to the file, but it also has the content. And the content is the, the text that the file was created for. So imagine like an image uh, or, or a PDF. So if you want to test your pipeline uh, that you feed files with, and then you want to check the inference, like you want to be able to see if your file is properly injected in the system, you can search on it. So this text that you could use to search on it in your search engine after your pipeline is processed. And uh, let's go on. And you can pro also provide the text, uh, the content of the file manually, just like this, this Alice in uh, Wonderland text. And you provide it in a contest argument and use the same, you, you create a docx file using this, uh, this text. And um, yeah, it's created. Um, in, in case you need uh, the, a more structured template, like, I don't know, you want to come out, make an email or document like that, uh, you just provide a string with this, um, and these are all uh, sort of tags or providers inside uh, the standard providers of fake library. And what you get uh, is this PDF generated uh, using that content. Oops. I don't know why it fails, but... Um, yeah, also the, the archives. Uh, they are also uh, archive supported, and the archive is like a zip file, it can be a tar file, or email file, because uh, what is an archive? It's a file that contains other files. And uh, they are supported too, uh, so you just, um, by, by default, you just have this, it's, uh, the, um, the zip file created with a file text file inside. But you can go further than that. There is this, uh, uh, the inner helper functions for creating archi archives are uh, created, and every um, file type uh, in this library has correspondent uh, helper function, and then you can create actually, uh, in this case, you create an archive which contains archive, and then which contains archive, and then it contains like docx file, uh, which is rendered according to the template. And if you need a more structured way of doing this, uh, let's say, say you have, uh, you need a zip file with a single docx file and then two XML files, which does contribute to the structure, this is kind of, uh, you do it. Uh, if you need uh, just bytes, not, not the files, uh, you, could, you could provide the raw true argument to the thing. Um, and uh, storages. So if you work with uh, some frameworks like Django, uh, they, uh, and, and you want to use dynamic fixtures, um, Django will throw an error if your file being saved into the system is anywhere different than your media root directory. Uh, and to solve that, there is this uh, system uh, that file storage is um, implemented. And um, so the way you do it, if you work, at, if you work with dynamic fixtures, is that you provide your Cynix media root to, um, uh, to it, and it's generated. Uh, it also works with network storages, so remote storages. So you can create your um, uh, test, your files, right into AWS or Google uh, Drive or Azure. And uh, yes, there's a and CLI. And thank you very much for your great talk. <laughs> Our next speaker is Senna. Thanks. Thank you. You can share this for me. Hello, 
everyone. I'm Sanait, so lovely to see you all. And I'm a recent electronic engineering graduate, and now I'm pursuing my master's degree here in Prague in data science. And today I will try to introduce you Kata. And I will take it in aspects of discipline and motivation. Kata is a philosophy, and uh, it is originated from what you're seeing, karate. Um, um, the main goal is to master a subject, expose yourself repeatedly with one niche example uh, so that you could improve and acknowledge the practice itself and at the same time uh, you could get into flow. That's the main purpose of it. And as you can guess, this is making it much more adaptable to any kind of field. That's why um, I applied it in programming and it's already practiced in programming as well. Uh, because it's solely based on training your muscles, stretching your brain to not memorize, but actively participate in that part, in that particular task. Um, imagine doing something repeatedly every day because it's recommended to do katas uh, early in the morning before everything because your mind is in a clear state and you should benefit from that. And, uh, it, but you're doing the same exercise every time. And since you're doing it like that, it is uh, making you kind of gain some new perspectives on the thing that you keep seeing every day and make you kind of connect with it. And it actually gives you a sense of accomplishment as well because this is something that you did yesterday, even the day before that, and today you're trying to do that as well. So you're seeing it repeatedly, you're connecting with it, at the same time you're learning the different perspectives. Um, in terms of programming, my sister was reading clean code and then she said she knows that I had some overthinking over programming because I'm coming from electronic engineering and I had a hard time transitioning to CS. But uh, she said in this book, in the uh, 14th chapter, uh, Uncle Bob uh, is recommending doing katas and how to explains, how to explain, uh, explains how to imply them. And I would really recommend this book to you because CS mindset is something that I really admire. Since all of them are coming from, you know, based on philosophies and hippies, they seriously are doing something great. And I'm listening to them. Um, let's come see to some examples. Uh, in here you're seeing an IBM example because they have a website with these kind of uh, listings. Experts and your mentors are actually trying to tell you this. They keep telling you practice more, but I do not like hearing that because I think it's not detailed enough. And uh, by practice more, they're actually trying to say participate actively to what you're trying to learn. And in terms of actively learning something, you have to question it yourself, not listening to someone and not copy paste it, but seriously think, what can I do to solve this next step? And it could, be, it could be the most easiest task that you choose for yourself. This is my kata. It could be like a string sum, odd even example, or like finding the prime number, or like any kind of digit question, that uh, initial interview questions. You can choose it as your kata and say, I will go with it. But since I'm uh, an AI engineer, I would like to shout out to that. Uh, you could, I think, also do ML and deep learning katas. And you could do it by thinking, how can I build a perceptron? Because they asked me this multiple times in these interviews. And uh, yes, you should be able to explain it to yourself, for yourself, what I do, what is the first step, what's going on, and activations like building like Lego blocks in your mind uh, to be able to connect with that. And at, actually, for neural, neural development, it's proven to, if you actively learn something, it helps you develop some habits and learn that thing better. And since you're making connections, it's not getting lost in your brain too. So I definitely recommend you doing katas in terms of neural development as well. This is a meme, he's a tennis player and he's in a very cold uh, lake. He's saying, never give up since you're seeing I'm inside here and I'm still doing this. So you in your house sitting, you should never give up because like he's not giving up. And it's seriously worth it, you are worth it, to learn things better and getting in the flow with your own subjects. Uh, so I hope you will try Kata and I hope you will like it. And if you do, uh, please get in touch with me and let me know how it goes. Thank you. Thank you 
The next speaker would like to be introduced as this green guy. Hi, Mr. HDMI. <laughs> do I disconnect it? And I, I don't have USB-C. It's an old. HDMI. Yeah. You don't have a USB-C? No. Okay. Okay. Hello, my name is Moisés. Oh, I just busted my identity, sorry. Uh, this is not there yet. But this is a talk about multitasking. Um, <laughs> as you can see, uh, let's mirror. And I believe, so this is Foxdot. Foxdot is a Python wrapper around something called Super Collider. Super Collider is a sound synthesizer, which we start with um, Fox dot, uh, Fox dot, dot start, because I don't want to use Super Collider syntax. And here we go, and we are running, and we run Fox dot, and we have an error on Super Collider, so this is not going to work. <laughs> um, so let's try again. And yes, I've been to this error before. Let's ignore. So this happens because when I connect, my MIDI controller will give me different uh, speeds here. So we just have to change the frequency of the channel. Oh, HDMI. OK, HDMI 48 output, 38 microphone, 48. And then, maybe now, okay. Good. Uh, yes, let's open this. I don't want this. I want to do something else. And I'm running out of time. Yay. It's less than I need. Okay. So basically, you can execute this Python code. Um, okay, let's make it. Visible. Let's sort scale. Let's play some notes. Do some chords. I hope I'll not kill people now with too much sound. Oh, it's coming it's quite loud. I can't hear the bass. Should be playing. I can't turn on the volume. It's playing, but very low. Yeah. Can someone? Take up the volume. I need volume up. I can't control the volume oh, you're on my side. No, it's connected. Is the AV team can? No, it won't work. Can the AV team put the audio up? Normal HDMI. Yeah. So there's an USB here. And so Python there, ukulele. Do you need me to change the output? This probably need to be set up the output. Oh. The audio card. We need to set it this before. I see. Here, USB. MDB, OK. Output, I see. I know what's happening. Uh, yeah, it's playing. Yeah, I need to restart. Oh, yeah, kill all servers. Maybe. Mm. 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 I can always come back next year.
let's see how many can we fit. That I'm sure Forever young I wanna be Forever young I won't hesitate No more, no more This cannot wait I'm yours This is the way you left me I'm not pretending No love, no hope, no glory No happy ending Cause you are amazing Oh we did amazing things If I could Then I would I'll go wherever you will Can you feel The love tonight And she will be loved And she will be love pictures of you and pictures of me hung upon your wall for the world to see cause I can't live with or without you whenever I fall at your feet you let your tears am I not pretty enough cause I'm not here for your entertainment you don't really wanna mess with me tonight can read my, can read my feel you can read my poker face come on Barbie let's go party <laughs> That's how many songs you can fit in a lightning talk. Thank you. Thank you for this great performance. Our next speaker is Julian, who will tell us something about Wiki Crawl. And in the meantime, I would like to ask uh, Christian to come here with the topic Python in your language to get prepared. Thank you. Hello, Python. Uh, I'm Julian, and I would like to share an, op an open source project with you, uh, Wikicrawl. So for the story, when I was a student, I was used to implement everything that came to my mind. And at this point, I did a crawler in Java that was quite ugly, and that was fetching Wikipedia pages, collecting links, and starting over and over until the memory crash. And so it was useless, not that fun, but a good way to learn. That's why I suggest a friend of mine who is learning Python to do the same thing as an exercise. And at this point, uh, at this point I uh, asked myself uh, what I would do differently if I have to do it uh, now with my experience. And here is the answer. So first, I will keep Wikipedia, Wikipedia because that's the best website in the world, you agree, I'm sure. Uh, after that, instead of a script, I will use a task queue uh, powered by Salary. And it's okay if it's useless, but at least I want it to be fun, so I will use a graph database. Uh, to go in details, uh, here is the pipeline. Uh, I, won't go in the, uh, I won't speech it, but there is two workers, one for the crawling, one for the recording. Uh, so, uh, to make it run on my computer locally, I'm using Docker Compose, of course, and I'm able to, to start it now. I will need to fine tune to, to find the, the good scheduling that avoid the crash. So, let's add uh, some monitoring to the stack Grafana, Prometheus, everything I need. And it's, it's not that bad. I have, a, uh, I have a dashboard, I can make it run over and over until I find the good schedule. So you will tell me I'm crawling Wikipedia over and over. Uh, that's not a, a good thing. I'm a bad guy, and uh, I prefer to avoid that. So 
Uh, let's uh, mock Wikipedia and add it to the, to the stack. At the end, I'm implementing a crawler. I have everything I need. Uh, so at this point, I guess I have everything to make it run. And yet, it's working. I'm able to uh, fetch the, donor, the data in the database. Uh, if we take a sample data set, there is real simple uh, relation, like an apple is a fruit. The, the page apple refers to the page fruit. But uh, what would be fun uh, would be to find really strange correlation between concepts that are really not linked to each other. And so uh, it will be fun, but at the point it's still useless. I did not find what to do with it. It's online, it's open source. Uh, please, if you want, contribute. That's all. Thanks for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Gabriel Jower. Oh, <laughs> that's not him. Uh, sorry. So, Christian with the topic Python in your language. Hello. I want you to, to answer me some questions. Who is here no, not a native English speaker? And who here can read and speak Czech? Okay, many hands. That's a good thing. Good. So this talk is that uh, I wanted to encourage you two things. The first thing is that uh, to check into some CPython internals. If you haven't, don't be afraid. You can discover new things. And there is a lot of things that I didn't know that were there. So for example, just compile the latest version from the repo, and then I discover many things. So let's start with the basics. So for example, when you have a list, and then you want to append an element, what do you use? Append, right? And then, yeah. what if you want to append an element twice? Nobody, nobody knows? Any core developer knows? You need to use append append, right? <laughs> what if you want to do something like uh, uh, appending something at the beginning of the list? And don't give me the boring answer of insert. <laughs> exactly, so you need to write append backwards. <laughs> Right? And there is. <laughs> but most importantly, there are many other things that I didn't know. For example, I noticed that there was a, a new method called translate. And then I checked, well, that's really convenient. We are in Czech Republic. I mean, we, we don't learn and uh, speak English so well. Sometimes we make uh, errors. So I was just checking it out. And then I said, OK, maybe we can do some, I don't know, translate. And then use the code. Let's wait a little bit. I don't know what it uses, maybe ChatGPT or something like that. And then I started to see, well, I have no idea what, how check is, right? So maybe you can help me, the check speakers. So if I want to check if this element is inside this list, how should it be here? It's not, it's not in, right? And yes, it works. <laughs> so if I want to see, for example, this is not there, <laughs> right? And also works. So I noticed that also everything else is translated. We don't have enough time, but you know the simple thing that we always teach our people, like uh, you know, like, okay, so you want to do a for loop, right? So you do, I don't know. <laughs> and there you have it. But the second, message, the second message that I wanted to give you is that, of course, that maybe not the proper solution to approach you know, Python to more people than a speaker. The, work, the proper approach is to uh, work in the documentation. Here you see a really beautiful diagram that I'm really proud of it. This is uh, all the people that contributed to the Spanish translation of the Python documentation. You can see all the names there. And now I have a, a task for you. So, I was checking the languages that we have in the Python documentation, and it's, there is no check there. So I think that you have something to do now, because remember, having the docs in our language or documentation in general, it's kind of like people can feel like home. And with that, I just wanted to say, let's enable more people to learn Python. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Gabriel Jover and he will tell us something about artists.
Okay. I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> um, um, yeah, like this. So, hi everyone in this afternoon. Uh, my name is Gabriel Jover. Um, for the uh, for the Alba synchrotron, which is a scientific infrastructure, we do, thi we do things with synchrotron light, and we have a, I'm here present introducing artists in the uh, in uh, it's a work done uh, with Kino and me, and the idea of this package is uh, to work seamlessly between different packages in CPU GPU. Uh, and in, in next future TPU also. So why Arctic? So what's the problem? So in, in science, we used to look for high performance and we are testing different libraries. And at the end, we are uh, using different frameworks, NumPy, PyTorch, GoPy, and other libraries uh, for Fourier transforms and tom uh, tomographies and in general. And at the end, we found out that uh, we want to have a common access for the different implementations that even though um, some of them, uh, they have the UFUNC dunders, uh, and they are not enough. So sometimes the functions doesn't re return the same or they are not interchangeable. The, the path to get to the function is not the same. So for making the code interchangeable and running on different uh, hardware, CPU, GPU, uh, different devices with different libraries and moving the data here and there, sometimes it is, is problematic. And we came up with the idea of having an, another library, having different um, uh, framework backends uh, and a common API for an homogeneous uh, using of all of them. So the approach is using also the UFUNCs, um, but uh, defining a, a frame, which is a, a combination of a device and the framework backend. Then we use artist arrays, which combines a, the, the same data and the frame. And then we can extend the different frameworks uh, writing the framework backend uh, for the different uh, extending UFUNCs when they are not there, when they are not there or uh, then uh, a co a unifying the output in form of an uh, artist array. So I am not brave enough to do a, 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 um, a, a live demo, but the idea is uh, like you can import artists and create a frame. Uh, you can choose your, your frame of choice between NumPy, QPy. Uh, you can create in the um, the arrays in, in any different, uh, either NumPy, QPy, uh, PyTorch, you can move them around from CPU to GPU. Um, here it's very explicit, but it, it also has default uh, frameworks for doing it uh, easily. Um, then we can call the function seamlessly. So uh, for example, here uh, we can call once, either in, in CUDA or in PyTorch, but we also keep the, uh, with the idea of having a common API. So in, in Torch, you can call a brand for, or any other function as you will do in NumPy, but we also keep the, the original framework uh, in case you, you are more comfortable, but you have to be aware in that case that in which framework you are. So the current status is that it's modular, so you can extend the frameworks, adding more implementations uh, as entry points. Uh, it's expandable also in terms of modules. Um, so the idea is that uh, you implementing module for Fourier transform, where we can work with different libraries, transformations and rotations, tomography, spectroscopy, and other scientific cases with a common way so we can run them and test them in CPU, bring into the processing in GPU in the, in the farms, or next, they're also working for TPU. Uh, it was thought to be already published, but not still, so I guess in a few weeks we will have it uh, public in the repository in GitLab. And that's all. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Our next speaker is Miro from our local Czech community. Thank you. I am so nervous I can't find my HDMI connector, but I found it. It's on the left. Uh, okay, so what happens now is that I want to mirror this. Is it working? Probably yes. Hello, uh, so I've been at this conference for a while and every, every time I met someone new or uh, someone joined our table when we were eating or drinking coffee, I, I handed them a sticker. Uh, this sticker with the old logo of, of what I'm gonna talk about and a lot of people were like, yeah, I, I know the thing in the middle, I know the thing on the right, but what the hell is the thing on the left? And I said, that's Fedora, that's Fedora Loves Python. And people say like, what is Fedora? And I was like, okay, you didn't know. And so I decided to tell it to everybody once instead of doing it 100 times. So Fedora is a project that goes for Fedora Linux, which is a Linux distribution. I know I lost half of you now, like I don't do Linux. But uh, unlike other operating systems, we are not trying to target everybody. We try to target the users that create, whether it's code, design, whatever, makers. Uh, not just consumers who watch YouTube videos. And uh, what I do and what we do in our team is that we try to make Fedora the best operating system ever for Python programmers. I have this assumption that we have some Python programmers here. Do we have some? <laughs> so why would you want to use Fedora Linux if you use something else? Uh, obviously, uh, it's because we have Python. Uh, that's not very, like, we, everybody has Python nowadays. But uh, the thing that Fedora has, and I don't know, Debian doesn't, for example, is that if you have Python, it is Python. It, it contains everything. So if you have Python in Fedora, which is almost always, uh, you can straight out go create a virtual environment, use pip to install stuff. You will not get weird errors that you need to install some additional packages and stuff like that. Uh, that's good but uh, there are other operating systems that offer this as well. So what we have more is that uh, you can install almost any Python at all. So for example, if you go and you do sudo dnf install, which is like the natural way to install packages on Fedora, or you can use a uh, clicking thing if you prefer, you can install Python 3.12, you will get the latest and greatest beta 4. And it's not just Python 3.12, if you, for example, install Tox, uh, it will, by default, install all the Pythons that we support, so then you can run your code, your tests, on different versions of Python, be it uh, old Pythons that are not supported upstream, but are supported, for example, in some enterprise distributions, be it the new Pythons that haven't been released yet, be it PyPies, uh, we have that all, and we keep it up to date. It usually takes a few days because there is some way of testing after upstream releases it, but uh, we have this and you will have this on your computer if you use Fedora. You don't need to compile your own, you don't need to use some PyVams or whatever, you just get it. What's also important for us uh, as Python developers is that our Python is almost vanilla. It's almost, we have two patches. 10 years ago when I joined the team, we had 200 patches in Python 2, and lots of Linux distribution patch a lot. We now have only two patches, and we have a long-term goal to get rid of all of them. So whenever we need to change something, we go upstream to see Python, and we talk to them, and we talk to them, and we talk to them, and we try really hard not to have patches that are only ours. We also have a Fedora Python Classroom Lab, which is something you can download and then install in an environment where you teach people who don't have their own Fedora. It also comes in containers and uh, vagrant boxes. So you can use that if you have a workshop or if you teach beginners, you can use Fedora, which is optimized for teaching Python. There are pre-installed stuff and you don't have to set up the environment. We also have a GitHub action. So if you want to use Fedora on your CI because you are not re yet ready to use it on your computer or because you already are, you can check out Fedora uh, Python uh, talks GitHub action and use that. Uh, basically runs Toxus with all of our Pythons uh, on GitHub actions. What we also do is that we drive changes forward. So for example, we spent the last half a year or more 
integrating Python 3.12, which is now in the beta phase, into Fedora, and we will rebuilding the world. 5,000 packages we have with the new Python. We've been reporting problems to upstreams, be it Python, be it the projects. Or we try again, again with new releases, again and again. Uh, and you. you're welcome. <laughs> and 10 seconds. We also do this for other projects like Scythe and Pythons and everybody else. We try to be very cool with our upstreams and contribute a lot. So if you haven't, check out Fedora. FedoraLovesPython.org. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sebastian, and his topic is named F star star K it. All right. So. I gave this talk last year, but uh, by talking with a bunch of you and uh, checking out your talks, I realized that you all still have bugs in your code. <laughs> so here we go again. No, it's good, it's good, I got it. Don't worry about it. Oh, I lied. <laughs> Is it not this one? Is it, is it USB-C? Oh, sure, sure, sure. But I'm going to have to... Oh. It was not my fault. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Uh, yeah, the other side. Yeah. Or straight Maybe HDMI just put it, connector. put it in this guy. Put it in this guy. Put it in this guy. Uh, just try it. Yeah. Oh. Well, this kind of sucks. Still nothing. Still nothing. Can I connect something else directly? Can you just do, do the HDMI? Yes, I can, but I would, like, I would prefer this reduction because we know that it's already working. Well, it doesn't seem so to be working. This worked fine uh, earlier today for my talk. So like I said, uh, some of you guys still have bugs in your code. So I'm going to teach you how to fix production code in five minutes. Uh, disclaimer, this may get you fired. <laughs> so uh, don't you hate it when it's like uh, 7 PM, uh, you spent the whole day coding, and you've tested nothing, because why would you? Uh, you haven't used type hinting, because your CTO told you not to. And your code doesn't work. It has a bunch of bugs. You just want it to silently work and uh, pass all the tests and go to production. Introducing Fuckit, the error steamroller. <laughs> Fuckit is a Python package. You can just install Fuckit with pip install Fuckit. And then whenever you have a function that doesn't work, you just use the Fuckit decorator, and it works. So as per the documentation, uh, the module is like violence. If it doesn't work, it means you're not using enough of it. So you just chain <laughs> fuck it calls, all right? Finally, there's advanced features you can use. You can use the fuck it context manager. When there's a bunch of code, you don't know what's failing in it, just with fuck it, vroot, and it works. You can even use it to fix broken imports. Now, I know some of you are a bunch of open source guys, and you're worried about using other people's code. But don't worry about it. It's with a do what the fuck you want to do public license. <laughs> it only has one clause. You just do what the fuck you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> so
So the next time your intern, your boss, or one of your friends comes over and says, oh no, production is fucked. Fuck it. <laughs> Thank you, and the last speaker is Charles, who will tell us something more about Jungle Girls. Okay, uh, let's uh, talk a bit about myself. Uh, I'm Chill, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a lead backend engineer in Kraken Tech, lovely plushies. Uh, I'm a, a board member of Django Software Foundation. I'm serving as a vice president this term, this two years. Uh, I'm a, a co-organizer of uh, PyCon Turkey and Uh, also, co-organizer of London Django Meetup, uh, member of Pi Ladies, as Deb mentioned. I'm a new uh, PSF uh, managing uh, member, but what am I talking about all this thing at the end of a three-day conference? Because it all started with me starting to organize a Django Girls workshop. So today, we're going to talk about Django Girls and how it can empower me, you, and everybody. Um, so, um, what's Django Girls? Django Girls is a one-day workshop. Uh, actually, Django Girls is a non-profit organization that helps uh, volunteers organize a one-day workshop. The idea is to uh, empower women about pro programming. Uh, funny enough, the, the Django Girls actually uh, born in EuroPython in 2014. Ola and Ola decided to uh, run this uh, beautiful workshop, Django Girls, to teach women uh, programming. And uh, now, today, after nine years, we managed to do over 1,000 events all over the world, like over 100 countries, with like 23K part participants. It's like, uh, it's huge, right? But, uh, What's, what's so good about Gen Girls? So um, everybody has their different takes uh, from it. Uh, what, is good, uh, what, it, what is good about Gen Girls is like, uh, first, it's like zero barrier. Like you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to have the tech background. It is just to show programming is available and doable for everyone, by everyone. And, um, like, uh, it's a volunteer-run event, uh, and it's not only for the attendees, but it's a very good opportunity for, uh, let's, for like, us, mentees, mentors. Like, uh, what we do is we gather together, we follow the Jungers tutorial. It's actually a quite like self-explanatory uh, tutorial that you can even do yourself as a total beginner. But uh, we do to, uh, sit together in small groups, one mentor, three participants usually, and we hack all day. We empower each other. I'm going to uh, mention also about a few other things, like there, is, there are some like, huge community effort. Uh, Django tutorial translated to, like, I don't know how many languages, more than Django tutorial itself. Uh, 
This is a map. Uh, and it is so easy to start your own event. You can just like uh, find a few uh, other people who is like as patient as you about uh, um, love of programming or increasing uh, the diversity or just like empower the other fellow women uh, developers. Uh, there are like beautiful materials. Uh, even if you're not organizing a Django, uh, I highly recommend you to like take a look. Uh, tutorial is always good to like um, suggest uh, to beginners, all beginners. Organizers manual is a great tutorial if you're like organizing um, any community event from a meetup to a conference, and uh, like coaching, just use it daily if you're mentoring anyone at work or in, in your open source project. And uh, we don't only like do uh, programming, we do crafts. We do have fun, we do have dinners, we do lots of stuff and too many. And I'm here because I want you to care and uh, have fun. See you next year. Thank you all for your great talks and musical performance. Now I would like to welcome on stage Nail, who will tell us what are the prizes for AI game tournament. Cool. Hi. Hello. So I'm here to tell you how uh, the video game tournament went. It was awesome. Um, before I do that, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, I'd like to thank the people that helped me set this up. Uh, Raquel, Arthur, Sebastian, uh, Patrick, Vibi, and Sonio. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, O'Reilly for providing books as prizes, and also a big shout out to the Numberly guys for 3D printing the trophies that you see there. So we had 15 teams that took part, and uh, yeah, without further ado, those are the results, missing the top three spots. It was actually super close. Uh, the scores were pretty tight. Um, so, in third place, uh, please welcome to the stage, if they are still here, uh, Alpentroni. Second place, Artis, 65 points. Anyone from the Artis team? We'll, uh, we'll find you later and give you your prizes. <laughs> Thank you. 
Right. And the winner is dot dash dash dot with 85 points. Thank you. Congratulations to everyone. Thank you for listening. See you next year.